Good evening and welcome uh, from Mossman Council and from me. I'm Dr Ruth Irwin. I'd like to give a special welcome to the two councillors that we have here, Councillor Bendel and Councillor Menzies. Very nice to see you here. As I said, I'm Dr Ruth Irwin. Um, I'm a Kiwi and I haven't been in Australia very long, only about six months. So this is a, you know, a big learning curve for me. Um, and I want to acknowledge the country of the um, Baragal and Kamaragal people that we are standing on today. And I wanted to go into that in a little bit more detail, partly from my own perspective, um, coming from a country where Māori are the indigenous, pe indigenous people, and that's been a very important um, element to my own cultural upbringing. So I'll, I'll, go, I'll think about that a little bit more um, in a few minutes. The context of this workshop that we're having today is to talk about resilience in the context of writing an action plan, a climate action plan for Mossman Council. And that has come out of the climate emergency declaration in November last year. So we're going to be getting you to jot down a whole lot of notes and discussions and we will be collating that and using it for our plan um, moving forward. We are living in very strange times, you might say. This is a shot from the fires last summer. And those fires, or at least that temperature, that level of temperature that we had last summer, is likely to get more frequent as time goes by because of climate change. So one of the things that happens there is that the perspiration or the evaporation cycle of water is getting much faster as the global temperature on average heats up. So at the moment we're about 1.1 degree above pre-industrial levels in terms of uh, the mean temperature. And what that means is that the soils have dried out a lot. The trees have dried out a lot. Um, and that makes it for conditions where fire is very likely. And again, I wanted to come back um, to the Baragal and the Kamaragal people and think about the fact that for 60 to 100,000 years, those people managed to live in this land and take care of it and have a kin relationship with the land and the water and the other flora and fauna that we no longer have in modern times. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that. At the beginning of the industrial era, or even slightly before that, when Descartes was um, around in sort of the 1640s, there was a big shift in European thinking that divorced people from, the, from nature. So there was a, a sort of a philosophical shift that made it very clear that human subjects view nature, but we're not part of nature anymore. And that's a very significant shift from an indigenous way of thinking about things to a modern way of thinking about things. So when I'm thinking about um, indigeneity, it's certainly true that we won't be going back to Stone Age adzes or even you know canoes on the waterfront or anything like that. But we can be taking a lot of ideas from indigenous peoples and thinking about how you can have an integrated relationship between the environment, the ecology, and the social community. So a sort of a social e ecology, if you like. This slide here, this is from the Stockholm Resilience Centre, which is a very important uh, centre of research that's been going for oh, a good 30 odd years. Um, and they, so a lot of the understanding of resilience comes from the Stockholm Resilience Centre. And this is their definition of resilience. So what they're interested in is that resilience starts from the belief that humans and nature are strongly linked, which is coming back to what I was saying before. And they also suggest that um, rapid human development, which is a particular kind of human development, uh, is forcing, um, planet it's forcing us into what they call planetary limits. And those limits are about things like fresh water, the climate, um, nitrous and phosphates in the soil um, and, and various other things that we'll go into in a bit more detail soon. So they suggest then that technology need, and, and the way that we do things needs to become ecologically literate. 
And this is a quite a significant shift from previous earlier ways of doing things over the last 200 years. And if we do that, it can be quite subtle. We're not necessarily changing lifestyle in any major way, but we are starting to think that everything we do needs to take ecology into account. Absolutely everything we do. Our decision making, our governance, our technology, our economics, all social relationships have to be involved with ecology instead of separating them out like we have in the last 200 years. So it's very simple, it's very subtle, and it's also very effective. And I think that it can create a massive sea change um, that will help us to cope and have resilience over the next 30 or 40 years. I was thinking about what is a resilient system, and a resilient system is exactly that. It's a kind of a systems theory. And it's about having a, a sense of identity, if you like, a sense of cohesion. Sometimes it's called the balance, the balance of nature, for example. And you can see where we can see that, if you like, the balance of nature has really shifted in the industrial period. So this slide here, which I went into in quite a lot of detail in the mitigation workshop, so I'll just quickly gloss over it today. Um, but what you see there is the natural cycles of the Earth over the last 800,000 years. This is using ice core um, samples from the Vostok ice cores. And what they do is they look for carbon dioxide, the amount of carbon dioxide that are in the ice cores going back 800,000 years to make a very um, clear understanding of how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere. And the graph that I showed last week showed you that the planetary temperature keeps track, it correlates very closely with the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So we are at the moment um, actually at 416 parts per million volume. And the last time that the planet was at 416 parts per million volume was when the dinosaurs became extinct at the end of the Pleistocene period. So we are at a very, very important uh, watershed where the internal integrity or the balance of nature has been thrown out of whack really quite seriously. So resilience is about understanding what that internal cohesion is all about and where the limits are to, the, to that internal cohesion and how we can um, bounce forward in a constructive way and, and find that these limits that we're facing at the moment are actually really important for forging our relationship with ecology in the future. So the idea of resilience is that it's a self-organizing system, and there's a couple of ways that you can understand a self-organizing system. So you, as a human being, as a person, you are yourself a resilient self-organizing system. Your heart beats, your body temperature is 39 degrees. If it goes to 41 degrees, you're probably going to die. If it goes to 35 degrees, you're also going to die. You, you actually can only function within quite a narrow range of internal systems. And if you get out of kilter, if your body comes to the edge of any of those systems, then it helps to teach you what to do and what not to do. So it's not necessarily altogether a bad thing. You know, if you go out into the um, well, we're in Australia, I was going to say the freezing snow because I've just come from Scotland six months ago, but Instead, I'll say the, the, the heat in the desert. <laughs> so if you went out into the you know, really hot area um, and you got overheated, and that is very likely to happen more and more and more, as we saw from the fires that I had up at the beginning, um, then obviously your staying within 39 degrees body temperature is going to be much more difficult. So you're going to respond to that in some way. So there's a sort of an internal integrity to any system that actually wants to maintain itself. It wants to maintain its balance, its internal balance. And what's happening with the Earth, or what happens when you shift from one integral system to the next, you can go, go, go through something like a metamorphosis. And if you do go through something like that metamorphosis, then you're going to enter a completely new state. 
So you could think about water, for example. Water is a liquid, and it, it's actually really quite difficult to make water into a gas. So what happens with water is you get what's called Brownian motion. So you, you heat it to 100 degrees. Now the normal science would tell you that water will turn into a gas steam at 100 degrees, but it doesn't actually. What happens is you heat it up to 100 degrees and you overheat it and it's ready, it's ready, it's ready to become a steam and it doesn't actually transform into a steam until a point of difference, and nobody ever has any idea what that point will be, what that threshold point might be, suddenly triggers the water into, a, into steam. So what happens is a speck of dust or something alights on the surface of the fluid, breaks the surface tension, breaks the internal consistency, the internal integrity of that system, and allows it to transform into something different, something new. And the thing about entropy is, you don't necessarily get to go backwards. Once you've done that breaking, and you've transformed and metamorphosed into the next whatever it is, you can't necessarily go backwards. And so where we are at the moment, in relation to this graph here, is we're at that overheated stage. Now we haven't actually had the moment of difference yet, or at least we've had many multiple moments of difference, but it hasn't actually triggered the, the final metamorphosis yet. So we are still in a state of integrity, but we're at the very outer limits. And we are what, what you might call in terms of Brownian motion, overheated. So we need to come back to a, to a stasis. And that stasis is about 280 and at the outside 350 parts per million volume of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So 416 is well, well too high. And the thing about climate change is it's cumulative. Every year is accumulating higher and higher amounts of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So last week with the mitigation workshop we were thinking about how to reduce carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Today we are going to look at how we can um, maintain that integrity, maintain our resilience by understanding where the thresholds are and by considering what we need to do as a social ecological system to stay in some kind of balance, to look after each other and to look after the ecology that we live in. Here I've just put down some of the risks that we're needing to think about when we think about resilience. Um, one of them is obviously global population, which I won't go into in great detail. We'll probably talk about that a little bit more when we talk about the futures. But part of uh, the massive increase in the global population, so we've gone from about one billion people across the planet at pre-industrial levels to 7.8 billion at the moment, and it's going to go up to 10.5 billion by 2100. So there are some complicated factors there to deal with, and then especially in the next 40 to 50 years. Um, obviously, global warming, uh, I've, that's the sort of the increase in temperature and the increase of the perspiration cycle, the water cycle. There's polar and ice melt, particularly ice melt on land, because then, if, I don't know if you've done that experiment when you were a kid at school, but if you have a glass of water and you melt, you put ice cubes in it and it melts, the glass of water, the water actually stays at the same level. It doesn't really matter whether it's ice or whether it's fluid. It's, it always stays at the same level. But when you put new ice in there, in other words, landlocked ice, the water rises. So that's the danger, is that all the glaciers across the world, and especially Greenland, are melting at a very rapid rate. In the last four or five years, they've been um, melting at something like thousands of times faster than in the past. Um, and all of that landlocked ice is coming into the sea. So we are almost certainly looking at about a 50 centimetre sea rise in the Mossman area, and that's a very conservative estimate. Uh, so I've already talked about the increase in water cycle, sea level rise. Um, the thermohaline current, I think I might have taken that slide out. But the thermohaline current, yes I did, uh, that actually takes, 
It's like the thermostat of the planet. And it takes water all the way around the planet in a big sort of figure eight loop, goes round the poles, round the um, equator, and then back up to the top pole and back down again. And it actually circulates not only temperature, so it keeps the equator area reasonably cool and it keeps the um, polar areas reasonably warm, keeps everything fairly even, it also distributes nutrients. So if the thermohaline current were to come to an abrupt halt, uh, the fishing industry, fishing would be very, very compromised because the fish would have nothing to feed on. The nutrients from the, from the thermohaline current wouldn't be circulating. And that is slowing down. It's never, ever been known to slow down before, but it is looking very juddery at the moment. Forest fires, obviously, desertification, obviously. Extinction levels are the highest th that they have been since the end of the Pleistocene at the moment. So we are, look, we are right in the midst of the fourth great extinction event on the planet. Soil erosion and soil quality is a major issue. Monoculture is a major issue um, for diversity and resilience. Think about how the limit conditions that you've just been talking about refract back on what we might do to bounce forward in other words, to build resilience. To build resilience thinking about the future. So we have done things in a, in a sort of a, a normative continuity in the past, but over the last 200 years we know that some of those norms that we had are toxic. They're creating the problems that we are now facing. So how do we bounce forward? How do we take these limit conditions that we've just talked about and start thinking about new ways of doing a new norm, a safer norm, that brings us back into integrity, brings us back to, say, 350 parts per million volume, for example. So I'm asking now, what are our strategies? What are our strategies for resilience? We, what sorts of things do we need to change within our communities to make them safer? to make a more cohesive community, to make a cohesive community that's cohesive not just with our neighbours, that's really important, and also our neighbours, the flora and fauna, our neighbours, the water, our neighbours, the land, thinking back to our acknowledgement of country. So what sort of things can we do that create strategies for resilience looking forward? What can we do that is a very healthy strategy moving forward into the future. Let me give it to you in, another, uh, in a completely different way. You could argue that we have diabetes now. We have metabolic syndrome. We've been eating a bit badly for quite, you know, most of our lives, and we now have a, an, an ongoing chronic metabolic problem. Now, you can actually get over diabetes if you stop eating sugar if you just stop eating all sugar. Now that includes bread, it includes cake, it includes you know, a whole lot of gluten, full flours, and you, instead you have to completely change your diet and live in a very clean way. And if you do that, in fairly short, you know, in about six months, you, most people will actually get rid of the diabetes. They won't have it anymore. So, if we think about our system now, our you know, modern system, we've been using huge amounts of fossil fuels, which is like sugar. It's a, it's a very energy-rich, energy-dense um, food, and it's made life incredibly tasty and easy, and it's made us flabby. This is flabby economics. So how can we tone down, you know, how can we or should I say get toned? How can we have a better met metabolism within our society, within our system? Uh, so this is the Sydney uh, City Context Report where I, where I took those earlier slides. And I think that one's really interesting. And you can see that not all of it's climate change. You know, a lot of it is um, pandemics, it's uh, the... It's the uh, financial system, um, things like digital problems or digital change, 
which can do th impact things like our democracy. So there's a whole lot of ways in which shocks and vulnerabilities are coming in into the system, and climate is one of them amongst many. And these are some of the things that that report is talking about in terms of infrastructure that we need to be thinking about. So you've got there um, a sort of an honest appraisal of what the vulnerabilities are. That's the first place to start. So I know that we talk quite, you know, some of the discussion that's come up today has been how do you deal with people that can't actually face up to some of the things that are going on? So that's one of the things that we probably need to have strategies for because in itself it is one of the issues to deal with. And then on the, this side here, um, it's talking about the infrastructure that makes our society possible. So again, if you're looking at the limits and the vulnerabilities and the shocks, it helps us to reflect back on what are the infrastructures that we need to have so that we can bounce forward safely. Railways, I was gonna take the train from Melbourne up to Sydney and um, the train fell off the tracks because the infrastructure is so poor, right? So this is one of the things that we need to be thinking about. This one's interesting because it shows, um, so instead of focusing in on the vulnerabilities themselves, it shows us that it's actually the governance practices that are really gonna help resilience take place. And that's having meetings like this it's helping formulate policy at local government, at state government, and at federal levels. And not only in the public sector, but also in the private sector. So you'll see increasingly that um, big corporations have resilience plans. BP has a resilience plan. Um, and these are really important parts of our society. And I think this one's quite interesting. Um, because part of resilience is actually flexibility. It's about being able to be, you know, it's awareness, awareness of what some of the issues are and having the flexibility to not stay set in concrete. So even though what we've had in the past is consistent and it's in the, the sort of integrity that I was talking about at the beginning, this notion of identity and integrity, the thing about identity is it's always changing. And if you have a resilient personality, for example, then you have a personality that's able to cope with shocks and vulnerabilities and doesn't get sort of stuck in a reactive phase, but is able to be flexible and flow with whatever the issues are. So this is what I was talking about before with bouncing forward. It's having the flexibility in our systems in our policy, in our economic um, values, and in things like our financial institutions, to be able to cope with these changes that are upon us, and that will become more increasingly upon us. And so lastly, what you've done, and what we're gonna take away from today, is this lovely list that you've created about um, what you think some of the vulnerabilities are and what perhaps some of the strategies might be to address them. This is, a, a, this is actually from Mossman, this um, Aboriginal picture here. Very, very ancient artwork in Mossman. And I kind of wanted to bring us back to that to talk again about how we need to be thinking about the social and the ecological together as one ecological system the community and our ecology at the same time. So at the moment we are doing two or three levels of work almost concurrently. So we're looking at a sort of a high level climate action strategy. In other words, we're going from the Paris Agreement um, and then looking at all the different regulations and laws that we need to be, that, that kind of create the context for thinking about climate action in Mossman and writing about um, how, how it all is gonna sort of fit together. So that's taking place. Uh, and the other thing we're doing is collating these kinds of lists, which will create a five-year action list of projects. 
So partly it's about, we're really looking at the quadruple bottom line, right? Which is the costs, the benefits, the emissions profile, and the governance, the governance structure. So those are all the policies and how it all fits into the council. So, and partly what we're doing, we've, we've created, so through the council, the council actually approved targets recently in July. Um, so the council operations itself are aiming at net zero by 2030 emissions. And what we're hoping is the aspirational goal for the community is for net zero by 2040. So that gives us 20 years for people to, you know, retrofit their houses, put solar panels up. Um, the grid is changing, so whether it's an, a sort of a centralised coal-powered national grid or a more distributed solar grid, these things are changing. And we want to be flexible and able to accommodate those kinds of changes. We're setting in place all the processes at the moment. The, in some ways, that list is already underway. So, for example, we've already put um, new solar panels on the Marie Bashir Sports Centre, which is already reducing emissions. And we've already done an audit of all of the council buildings, 45 buildings, to see which ones are worth putting solar on. And at the moment, we're starting to look at the structural um, integrity of those buildings, because some of them are very old, so you wouldn't want to put uh, so, uh, you know, a new solar array that's going to last 20 years on a roof that is probably only going to last another four or five years. So we've still got quite a lot of that work to do, and we're certainly not waiting to do that work. So we're already, aim you know, we're already in process with these big projects that need to be done to reduce emissions for the council. So I th for me, the process needs to be that this high-level um, policy work that sets the priorities needs to take place first. And then shortly, but we're, we're gathering this kind of information to create these lists. And as soon as that big um, policy document is out, the list will get prioritised in conjunction with that policy. So we've just um, approved, or the council's just approved creating a climate action consultative committee. And that climate action consultative committee will help with both the policy document and the prioritising of this list of... Yeah. So, thank you. And we'll see you at the next one.